Hello, everybody. As always, welcome to our short introduction for our today's session. So first, let's have a um, short view back to our last session. You all know this guy here. This is Hubert Dreyfus. He has become world famous as the first person to lose against AI chess program, although he wrote interesting books about the limits of AI. And in our last session, and here is the link to this session in YouTube, we discussed his approach of artificial neural networks and also the symbolic approach and very interesting um, relationships that he established uh, to um, really important philosophers such as the late Wittgenstein, and also Martin Heidegger. So we see that um, Hubert Dreyfus did great efforts in connecting um, artificial in intelligence science with um, the history of philosophy and also bridging the gaps between philosophy of technology and history of philosophy. I think this is a really interesting task. And today we will proceed to a more recent, I'm not saying philosopher, but perhaps scientists of behavioral scientists, a brain scientist, namely Paul Smolensky, who is still living and his very famous article um, on the proper treatment of connectionism. And in order to better understand what connectionism means and on also how the Turing machine works and um, other machines, for example, neural networks work. I hand over to Arno, Arno, who will now demonstrate to us the way they work, the way such machines work and how they are related to our uh, today's topic. So, hello, I hope you hear me and you see my uh, Firefox window. Uh, welcome again. Um, I'm trying to illustrate a little bit what is behind um, the theoretical discussions that we had in the last week and that we will have today. Um, if you remember Searle's text and his discussion about um, what, in what way we could call a machine intelligent, and his argument that no machine can be intelligent if it is following a program. If you remember this kind of argumentation, uh, you also um, are aware of the specific definition of a program, the specific definition of an algorithm, and the specific definition of a digital computer that was presupposed by um, Sir. And this basic idea was introduced by Turing for sure in on computable numbers and was also in the background of the classical symbolical approach of AI. Um, this is a little bit more complicated relation in fact, but nevertheless um, the general discussion presupposed, for example also in the earlier book of Hubert Dreyfus, that a digital computer is basically something like a Turing machine. And that means a digital computer consists on the level of its functionality, let's say, not on the level of its hardware. It consists of something like a processor, a reading and a writing head, a memory, and a table of instructions, as Turing called it, or a program. And I just wanted to remind you of this very specific understanding of um, a digital computer, which is until today um, very important and, for example, defines more or less what an algorithm is. So I just wanted to show you a very concrete example of a Turing machine that is programmed to, to test if a specific number is a palindrome. That means if a specific binary number can be re read in both directions, and it will be the same number. So the Turing machine in this case does, does exactly this to test if it's a palindrome. So we have a program which is written in a little bit complicated kind of syntax, but basically it's very 
simple. We can upload an input. And in this case, the input will be just written in the memory. And then we can start the program. And then you will see what happens. It first erases the first digit, scrolls through the whole sequence of numbers to the end, checks if the same digit is at the end of the, of the series, and then it does this in both directions until it finally doesn't find any further number. And then it, uh, then it um, produces the output. And that means here it is accepted that was in fact um, um, binary palindrome. I now change the input and then it should, um, should have a different result because in this case, we don't have a palindrome. Why do I show this? You see here, it stops as soon as it finds an, um, not the same numbers at the beginning and the end of this series of binary digits. Why do I show this uh, again? Because it makes clear the digital computer here uh, is based on the operation of symbols. The operations are defined by rules. The rules are predefined by a programmer and the programmer has to have an idea how to theoretically solve the task. Yeah? So someone here had an idea about what a binary digit is, uh, what a binary palindrome is. He had an idea how to solve uh, a test of a binary palindrome, namely going, starting at the beginning, going to the end, um, take the new end as the new beginning, going to the other end, check again if this is the same number and so on and so forth. So basically, a theoretical understanding of a human being uh, defines an algorithm, and this algorithm is implemented in a program, a table of instructions that is executed, and that does nothing else than manipulating symbols. No? So this kind of understanding of digital computers basically defined um, or was presupposed, let's say, by the symbolical approach and was crucial for the critique of artificial intelligence research and its symbolical approach in Searle, first and foremost, um, remind the rule, uh, the importance of rules, the importance of um, the manipulation of um, symbols and so on and so forth and China's room um, thought experiment. And it was also um, in the center of Hubert Dreyfus' earlier critique of AI. But in the text of 1988 of, um, of Hubert Dreyfus that we discussed last week, a new paradigm, as he called it, popped up because Hubert Dreyfus uh, was very much in contact with AI research. And he observed that something new happened linked to the name of Rosenblatt, Frank Rosenblatt, for example, in the 50s, and, um, and the Perceptron. And this kind of um, approach, very often called connectionist approach, as in the case of Smolensky's text, uh, starts with a different kind of basic thinking <clears throat> or basic thought. The idea here is to say, okay, we know at least some things about um, the system that thinks, namely the brain. And we try to construct a machine that is similar to the brain. Yeah. So the brain consists out of single processors called neurons. They are connected um, and um, every signal that is input in this kind of brain is processed through signal uh, through neurons and it's uh, many, many neurons and the specific connections between these neurons. And it is in fact that kind of approach, that kind of basic thought that defines the perceptron and that defines what is called today artificial neural networks. And this is, let's say, a kind of machine to speak in the word of Searle that works differently. Um, just a moment. So uh, <clears throat> it doesn't. It didn't help. So excuse me. Um, so how how does this machine works? Yeah, this artificial neural network. 
Uh, for some of you, it will be banal, but I think for some of you, it will possibly be helpful in order to understand the whole discussion. Here, we doesn't start with a theoretical understanding of the problem. We doesn't understand with, uh, we doesn't start with a rule. We doesn't start with symbols that are manipulated on the basis of rules. Here, we start with a machine that has signals and its input. I hope you see my cursor. So we have input one and input two, and you have connections and single processors. These single processors have different input inputs, and these inputs are added, fed in a kind of function, and produce a further output that is propagated through links to further signal processes. So what happens here? You have first an input that defines the input of the single processor N1. This is the same for the processor N2 and the same for the processor N3. Now you have the outputs of N1, N2 and N3 and can feed these outputs into the input of N4 and so on and so forth. So the signal of the input is processed through all the links and all the single processes of this network and finally ends up defining two outputs here. Yeah? The basic idea is very simple. <clears throat> and for sure, what such, such a machine can do depends heavily of the structure of the links. It depends on the activation functions, the functions that are processed by each single uh, processor or artificial neuron, if you want to call it in, in such way. And what is most important are the so-called weights. And the weights are real numbers or in the case of the computer floating point numbers that are linked to each connection between two single processors. So W1, W2, these are floating point numbers that define the importance, let's say, of this input in respect to this single processors. No? And that's why they are, if you um, go to the uh, calculation level, they are multiplied with the different inputs of the signal processors. No? So what happens here is that the relation between input and output is, if you presuppose the structure of the network and the activation functions in each single processor, that the relation of input to output is basically defined by the weights of the links. So the weights define what the output is to a specific input. Or to say it differently, what is in the case of the Turing machine, the program that defines what the machine does, what kind of out input is produced to what kind of output, this program is here, if there is any program, found in the weights in many, many weights. This is a very single, uh, simple artificial neural network. And the newest one, it's about billions of parameters of weights. And these weights define what this machine does. No? This is important to know because these weights are not defined by rules or something like that. No? They are just numbers, a bunch of numbers and a huge bunch of numbers. And this is important to know. This is not, um, these are not, I, not directly at least, not prima facie identifiable with roots. And second, they are not manipulating symbols or something like that. This is more um, the processing of signals. It is numbers that are uh, computed here. You don't presuppose something like a symbol one or something like that, or a symbol for it's true or something like that. These are just floating point numbers that are calculated. 
in basically something what is a mat matrix multiplication finally. So this is a totally different kind of machine. <clears throat> and what comes with it, this is most, most important, is linked to the question where the weights are coming from. For sure, you could just put into weights as you think it makes sense. So you could try to program this machine by just varying the weights. But this would be even in a small artificial neural network, uh, a pain, I think. <laughs> and it would be totally impossible in huge neural networks, totally. So the success of these kind of artificial uh, machines is linked to the approach that was already discussed at Dreyfus of learning. So what we, do, what we do, in fact, is we train this, these systems. And training means here we adapt uh, the weights in such a way that finally the system works more or less as we think it should. So what we do here, at the beginning, we have um, some weights. Normally, we, we set it random. And then we have some data of which we know what should be the result. So we know we want to have input 1, input 2, and it should end with an output 1 and uh, O1 and O2. So we can process the signal, and then we can calculate the error. And what we then do is we adapt the chain, uh, the weights in such a way that hopefully it will get better. Yeah? And this is starting from the end and it's going back to the input uh, level. Yeah? And that's why the one direction is called propagation of the signal. And this is back propagation of the error. And this, um, general method of back propagation was more or less only established in the 80s, and it was totally a presupposition for the success of these machines today and in the last decades. And if you want to see this in a little bit more uh, um, adequate fashion, here you can really <clears throat> set the weights by randomization, and then you can just start um, the propagation and the back, back propagation and the weights are adapted. But this is going much more, um, much, much too much into the details because it's only about the general idea which is important here, I think. And Smolensky, and this is very interesting, he is a cognitive scientist who starts with the idea or who, is, who grew up, let's say, <laughs> theoretically in a context where these kinds of machines were thought as a model for the brain. No? So it's about understanding the brain and having a model for the brain. Um, and this kind of approach was often in opposition to the approach um, to the understanding of computers based on the Turing machine. But Smolensky tries to do two things, and this, this will be in focus today, I think. On the one side, he tries to draw a sharp distinction between the two approaches, the digital computer and the Turing machine on the one side, and on the other side, the connectionist approach and the artificial neural network. But at the same time, he tries to draw a rather nuanced picture about the relations between these two approaches. And I think these two things, drawing the distinction and relating the different approaches to each other will be in focus of our discussion um, of today based on this text of Smolensky that is written in the same year as the text, or published at least in the same year as the text of Hubert um, Dreyfus that we discussed last week. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Arno, for your short introduction into the science of neural networks. And I'm now um, presenting, going to present the key questions for today's session as always. So first, 
Um, the question is, what does Smolensky understand by the symbolic and this subsymbolic paradigm? How are they technically implemented? The second question is, how does Smolensky understand their relation to each other and moreover to the brain? And the third question, to what extent can connectionist models be called rational? We could also add, to what extent can they be called autonomous? You perhaps remember that he um, was not quite explicit in this thesis, but we should really discuss this problem from, from a philosophical point of view. I'm going to stop the um, recording now, and we are then proceeding to our breakout sessions.